Welcome to Melt University. This series will help you build your brand, inform you on a variety of career paths, and introduce you to top executives in sports and marketing. Now, here's your host, the president and CEO of Melt, one of the largest independent sports and event marketing agencies in the country, Vince Thompson. Welcome back, students, listeners. Virtual Melt University, we're rolling on into the fall. Hope you're safely back in uh, in your dorms, your campuses, a, a virtual hybrid environment. Hopefully we'll get a little football soon, but uh, I have been uh, looking so forward uh, for many, many months since we evolved Melt U into a virtual environment to uh, get on with our <clears throat> next guest, um, Steve Coonan, CEO, the Atlanta Hawks. Uh, but that only begins to describe him as we'll unpack today. Uh, I first met Steve Coonan, I believe, in 1994 or 95. I'll never forget it. Um, it was either in Richard Scrucci's office in Birmingham or somewhere in the Coke Tower, but we go back a quarter of a century, which uh, is dating both of us a little bit, but <clears throat> oversees all business, financial, strategic operations for the Hawks and State Farm Arena. Uh, just an amazing what, it, what a job he's done with the Hawks and the rebranding of Phillips Arena into, into State Farm Arena and, and just an amazing career, an amazing person. 14 years uh, for Turner Entertainment. He was president of several of the networks and some of the rebranding you may have seen with turnaround drama and funny and all that was amazing. And when he and I first met uh, was at the Coca-Cola company where he's still known for some of the most legendary uh, and big ideas as well. He's also involved in the community, uh, amazing kids. We've been sort of like family. He's one of my business icons and idols and inspiration. And I promise you that uh, you're going to enjoy Steve Coonan today. So Steve, welcome to Virtual Melt University. I really have no desire to talk after that introduction. I can only disappoint, <laughs> but thank you. Uh, well, no, you've been a <clears throat> source of inspiration, man. I never forget uh, first two or three times that we met and, uh, you know, the advice that you're going to give to these kids today, you've always been an inspiration to me. But before we sort of get into the current day, one of the things that we, you know, because you're one of the greatest business success stories with three of the you know most vaunted you know brands in the NBA and, and Coca Cola in the world, uh, but we always like to take it back to where that original passion ignited. So, as a student at the University of Georgia, is this where this this drive, this passion? I mean, I don't even know how to describe you, but as a you know just a brilliant businessman, best idea guy in the planet. But where did the passion start? Um, I can assure you it did not start at George and my only <laughs> aspiration in life was I wanted to be a liquor salesman. Both my parents were in sales and, mm -hmm. you know, that's what I knew. And I wanted to be in liquor salesman. I worked in liquor stores at Georgia, you know, during weekends and um, summers. And when we weren't busy, I would read all the trade periodicals and I liked the business and I liked the industry. And my first job out of school was working for a local Atlanta company, National Distributors, mm -hmm. that did wine, whiskey, and spirits mm -hmm. in the Atlanta metro area. I had a feather duster. I had a, uh, I don't even, it almost looks like a pilot's case and a mm -hmm. box cutter and sold booths and built displays and took care of my products and orders and thought I was living the good life. I had a beeper. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Our our students probably don't know what a beeper is. After remind my son what a, what a dial-up is, but so so the infatuation was was a, a was around sales, but unwittingly you're beginning this process of understanding the entire consumer chain, which obviously has always led to your successes. But so then, what happened next? You. Well, uh, I didn't realize the consumer had a chain. I, I literally, um, through a whole confluence of craziness, right. I was offered to move to headquarters for Hiram Walker, which was located in Walkerville, Ontario, Canada, across wow. the Detroit River mm -hmm. at um, 27, recently married and really did not want to move and work outside of the U.S., much less outside of Atlanta. 
Mm -hmm. And so I turned down the job and learned an incredibly important lesson that day that companies are going to structure what's right for them, not what's right for you. They were eliminating mm -hmm. the Atlanta office and combining it with the Dallas office. So basically, if I didn't take the job at headquarters, my job was eliminated. Mm -hmm. And so it just didn't work. And I bet on myself, which is one of my lessons and tenets in life. Mm -hmm. And cold called the Coca-Cola company one day. Didn't even have to dial area codes back then. 6762121. <laughs> Head of marketing, please. And a guy named John Farrell mm -hmm. answered the phone. John went on to be president of Coke China and expanded them into China and was a very good fella. And I started my pitch to him about the bar and tavern business and what was happening in society with the alcohol and mothers against drunk driving and a lot of things that we take for granted today in the late 80s when this mm -hmm. was happening mm -hmm. weren't taken for granted because you um you really didn't have the awareness about drinking and driving and designated drivers and long story short convinced john that it was an opportunity for coke to sell more product in bars and taverns and it was an opportunity on a pro-social basis to be part of the solution for drunk driving and Lo and behold, he hired me and I was there 14 years and 13 different jobs from running sports and entertainment to heading worldwide advertising to running and launching many, many brands that are around today and several that aren't in business anymore. Mm -hmm. So you wow. so so you literally I, you've never told me this story, but but you literally made a cold call to the Coca-Cola company and pitched in an idea. So you so you took that. We talk to our kids, take the shot, be fearless and be passionate. You know, uh, uh, I, 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 the, the great Sergio used to say uh, frequently wrong, seldom in doubt. But 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 so you so you took the shot and the guy, he, you got the job. Yeah, I mean, he. So many times I get calls from young people who want to understand my career trajectory and all this kind of BS. <laughs> right, right. Um, I just went and told them how I could grow his business. I came in three days later and they hired me. Well, and that's what, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. What's so ahead. crazy is if he doesn't answer the phone, if he, his right. assistant, if, you know, his answering machine picks up, the entire trajectory of my life is different. Right. So. But you put but you put yourself in that position to win. And that's what we tell the kids. It's like, and here's the other thing. He could have just as said, no, I, I think you're crazy. I'm not going to do it. But you you Correct. sold that out in. But one headline we talk to our kids a lot about, show an organization how you can bring value to that organization. And you're going to get to the head of the class in any job pursuit that you pursue. And you showed value, right? Well, yeah, and the, one of the issues that I have with young people today is I don't want to hear you're a sports fan. That's a strike against you, okay? <laughs> I want you to be a fan of a discipline. I don't care if it's accounting or marketing or finance or sales or strategy, but when you tell me you're a sports fan, then you just told me your judgment's impaired, mm -hmm. and I have wow. no interest in dealing with somebody who's thinking with their heart, not their mind, and so you know, business is run by strategy and finance. And if you mm -hmm. can't help in those two areas, it's going to be hard to get somebody's attention. The strategy that I proffered was getting their bar and tavern, tavern segment connected to this pro-social anti-drunk driving piece that actually worked quite well for them. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, ideas are currency. When I got to Coke, I never really considered myself to be a idea guy or have a creative slant, um, you know, unless it was putting 30,000 crickets in a rival fraternity house, which that was pretty creative and pretty fun. Right. Um, but today I probably would have gone to jail for it back then. It was kind of fun. Yeah. No, we, we used to have a lot of fun back then. And of course there was no social media. There was no social media. Thank goodness. Oh. And, um, you know, you, you gotta be able to offer something and differentiate yourself. And if you can't, you're going to have a hard time till you can. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, you know, <clears throat> from the outside, everybody thinks working for an N NBA team or the Coca-Cola company is really sexy and really fun. And, hey, there's some fun elements to the job. But you're running a business. And your business is to get fannies in the seats, obviously, pre-COVID. 
Um, and that's to your point, strategy and finance. And I'm glad our idea, our kids heard it. And then ideas are currency. How do you bring that that, that value in? So, but so, ideas linked to strategy, just not ideas for the sake of ideas. Correct. And and, and so, you know, I've been I've been a fan of yours for many years while you were at the Coca Cola Company. <clears throat> and there's a, just a couple of fun stories I want you to tell. But the funniest one was the 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 the, the story you told about Church's Chicken, and I think this is right. And Spud Webb and Dikembe Mutombo, and you had a customer in, in Jeopardy. Correct. I, you got to share this with our with our students. Well, you got two of the three things pretty right. Okay. Um, okay. Basically, one of the tenants of the Coca Cola Company is they sell more than syrup. They bring marketing to their fountain customers. And my very first day, um, and this obviously is a lot better story with visuals. Um, my very first day, Pepsi, who owned Kentucky Fried Chicken, who had a strategic need to be able to become a supplier, not a competitor to the industry, made a giant offer to Church's Fried Chicken to become their soft drink supplier when McDonald's, very complex, entered the fray with the McChicken sandwich and McNuggets. The cost of chicken went up tenfold. Right. And so... In the soft drink business back then, you looked at your soft drink company as an extension of your marketing department, almost mm -hmm. like your agency, like what mm -hmm. you guys do really, really well. And we were given the challenge at nine o'clock in the morning to come up with an idea that sold white meat and dark meat chicken pieces like wings and thighs, not <laughs> right. um, the breast, which is what McDonald's drove the price up. Um, for the next, you know, 45 to 60 days to help them through this incredible time where their cost of goods went through the ceiling. Long story short, I came up with an idea that thematically tied wings and legs and thighs together with by creating, because churches, which is an urban city center chain, right. in 28 of their markets had 26 NBA teams. We created the Minute Bowl, who was seven foot seven, nothing but legs, <laughs> and Spud Webb, who was the NBA slam dunk champ, five foot five. It's like he had wings and Spud small potatoes. And we made a combo meal with <laughs> custom packaging. And long story short, it tickled people's fancy. Their business went up double digits when it should have been, you know, cratering. And it helped churches save the day from Pepsi. And it showed people at Coke that you could use sports as a marketing tool because till then it was advertising and signage. It really wasn't right. marketing the assets. It was hanging and painting the world red. Right. And we moved to paint the world relevant. So, so as I recall, your first day at work, and you had to get on an airplane and fly to Texas where they were, right? Yeah, they they told me to go to the board of directors meeting in San Antonio, Texas, and get on the company <laughs> jet. I didn't even know where the restrooms were, but um, I found my way out to Fulton County Airport and got on a Coke gorgeous jet with two flight attendants and myself <laughs> on my first day of work. My wife thought I was lying to her about what I was going out drinking with my friends. And I went to San Antonio, Texas and pitched it to the board and was able to save the business. So oh that my God. was a long time ago, but that is a story I will never live down. But it goes back to what you were saying, that ideas are currency. And you brought value to a Coca-Cola customer because we've, you know, we've had a lot of Coke folks on this summer and and talked about it. So suffice to say, you had a hot start coming out of the Coca-Cola company and went all the way up basically the the, the, the food chain of, of, of tons of jobs. And so what other, what other, you know, so 14 years, I, well, I'm, I'm sorry, I think it was 14 years of Coke. 14 uh, years of Coke and 14, Turner. Okay. So you're in the soft drink beverage marketing business. And you go into a completely, not totally different, but completely different industry of going to work for a, a, a multiple television network. So talk about the process of, you know, we've heard well, a lot I about wasn't shit. in the soft drink marketing business. And, and with all due respect to my host, that's a mistake. I was in the network business. I was in building connections <laughs> right? 
with right. people and brands. It had nothing to do with soft drinks. Right. The day Coca-Cola sells soft drinks based on their taste, they're going to go out of business. <laughs> right, right. They need to sell based on an idea, a feeling, a, a moment of refreshment. And so, it, you know, a lot of the principles are the same, no matter what business you're in, mm -hmm. what's your strategy, who's your target, how are you going to approach it? How do you allocate your resources? And what was interesting was Turner came after me because the guys at Turner and their strategic plan saw that there was going to be virtually an unlimited number of channels because of distribution, mm -hmm. direct TV, dish, um, Comcast, Spectrum, et cetera, had almost an infinite supply of inventory for, to carry networks. But mm -hmm. Turner's problem was TBS and TNT were being called T1 and T2 by cable operators and saying there's no differentiation between the two. They wow. shared the same movies. They share, shared a lot of the same programming. They even shared the NBA um, at that time. Mm -hmm. And so they said, I'm not going to pay you for both. I don't care which one you want. I'll just pay you for one. And so they hired me, which I, I give Turner credit because it wasn't a conventional mm -hmm. kind of decision. They hired I, thought it was, me. I thought it was amazing at the hire. I was like, this is well, genius. I thought they were dummies, but it turned out pretty good for both of us. Mm -hmm. But what happened was they knew they had to create brands that made sense on Madison Avenue it made sense on Main Street. And mm -hmm. we took big swaths of geography with TNT. We know drama is a drama's code for television that makes you think and feel. It touches your hearts and minds. It was mm -hmm. targeted to women 35 plus. It was upscale. And it used to be that TNT wanted to be all things to all people. And if you don't stand for something, you're dead. And right. especially when there's no barriers to choice, like flipping a TV channel. Different mm -hmm. in, a, in a grocery store where you might've bought an end cap, very different when in a nanosecond, you can dismiss a brand. Mm -hmm. And then TBS, we made a comedy brand, which targeted young people. It was almost their Prozac after work. It was a stress reliever. And ironically, the shows that have done the best on Netflix and Hulu and mm -hmm. all of them were the same shows we had on TBS, Friends, Seinfeld, Everybody Loves Raymond, Big Bang Theory. The difference is they didn't have them with commercials. We did, but we stacked people binge watched without even knowing. We didn't know the word back then, but it was that kind of comedic release. So TBS and TNT, we took it from a $1.7 billion business to close to $8 billion when I left in distribution and ad sales. Wow. And it was... Um, because cable operators valued them because they knew what they stood for. Mm -hmm. We made sports live male drama and we mm -hmm. made um, TBS, which was famous for the Braves. I took the Braves off of TBS, which is pretty bold move. No, that was, that was, I remember at the time you got some slings and errors for that. That was, that was, that was, that was cause that was big to your point. Well, you got to understand there's a big difference between a pimple and a cancer. Mm -hmm. A pimple is unsightly, hurts. It's going to be ugly for a few days. A cancer kills you, but pimples don't kill you. Mm -hmm. And you've got to decide, do you have the strength to withstand some big pimples um, and understand the difference? It's a horrible analogy, and I do apologize because I'm no. not making light of a disease, but not everything that happens is terminal. Mm -hmm. And so many companies today are so influenced by social media that people are able to change the way that company goes to market. Mm -hmm. And that's a very dangerous slope for companies or people to be swayed by social media. Because if you look in absolute numbers, it's not the majority. It's right. a loud group. Right. And you have to have the temerity to withstand it. And right. we were able to do those things. Right. No, I, I think it was, <clears throat> I think it was amazing because, and you know, you say we didn't really even realize what, binge watching was back in the time, but that is exactly what happened to me. I would come home from work, I'd grab a beer and I'd watch everybody loves Raymond and I'd laugh my ass off for an hour or so. And I'm like, Hey, okay, I feel better. And, 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 uh, and I just, I used to love, you know, how you would, but then the, you, you would force the cable operators hand cause they had to, 
choose different pockets of programming and different audiences as opposed to it being one size fits all. So basically unwittingly or wittingly, you did that. Yeah, I mean, we made them have value and cable operators own time every hour in the shows. And we were the most valuable thing to sell in their portfolio because they mm -hmm. were able to talk to advertisers about who they were selling to versus mm -hmm. being general. So, it, you know, remember the internet created specificity in targeting with unbelievable amounts of data. Nielsen ratings, which are the output and measurement of TV, have absolutely no who it is. It can only tell you demographics. Mm -hmm. It can't tell you psychographics or who that person was and what that person likes. Mm -hmm. And that's why you're seeing TV advertising be under assault today by, you know, the Googles and the Facebooks because of their ability to know exactly who they're talking mm -hmm. to. So, so question before we move on, would you want to run a cable television network today? No. With all the, the, the giant challenges? I mean, obviously. No, I mean, you know, let me ask you a question, Vince. Mm -hmm. Name another product that you buy a hundred of a month that you don't use. <laughs> You know, it's, it's, it's mind boggling because I can probably count, you know, and, and, and by the way, it's, it's clearly under distress now with the, you know, with, with no live sports on to speak of per se, I mean, NBA and golf and all that. But, um, and, and, and the, except we talked to our kids about the acceleration of cord cutting, which is going to impact, you know, so much stuff to your point, you made a comment before we came on or maybe we were talking, it could be years before we, before we get to the other side of, of this COVID, but, but so, so, okay, so then the third leg or fourth leg of this magnificent career, I, I remember I used to go to Hawks games and I would always see you sitting on the other side by the bench. And you just, and then by the way, those are some of the dark days of the Hawks. And I just, you, you, I, like, he, he's got, he loves basketball and he loves to be there and everything. But, and then how in the heck do you wind up as the president of the Hawks? And by the way, they were not in a good place when you went over there, correct? No, I mean, Literally, and a lot of the ways things happen is by network. We, my wife and I were out to dinner with another couple. He owned a small part of the Hawks. And he said to me, um, can you help us find a CEO? Wow. And I said to him, um, talk to me. What do you, he's like, the league wants us to hire professional management and they want us to hire a CEO. And I thought it was a really interesting and good opportunity to um, make a change and a pivot. I could see what we were at Turner and where the industry was going with Turner mm -hmm. and was very, very concerned that um, it was going to be um, not a brilliant future. Mm -hmm. We had um, a lot of programming that was filled with commercials and sometimes you just kind of have an inkling of what the future looks like mm -hmm. and candidly i looked at the lens of i wanted to do more for the community I, i'm very fortunate i'm an atlanta native i've been right. involved i'm chairman of the aquarium which is the largest ticketed attraction in georgia mm -hmm. um and, and i always thought that you know my last business chapter would be community and it's ironic that sports right. have proven to be more powerful than any politician or policy in bringing people together. So I wanted to unite and excite the people of Atlanta with Hawks basketball. And um, in a small way, we've accomplished the first mm -hmm. few steps of that. We've got a long way to go, but it, it's definitely um, a pretty, pretty interesting road that we're on. And we're starting to see now how really the the loudest voices in social justice are coming from sports right the nba in particular well i recall when you took the job i think the hawks were not really performing that well and one of the th first things you did was and i because I, I remember this you and i talked about it but you so you commissioned some either ad hoc focus groups or, or you got real focus groups and you got kids from the community. You tried to figure out geographically how to get people down there. And then you landed on this, this positioning of true to Atlanta. So, so talk about the process as I recall. 
I had brought my head of research from Turner with me mm -hmm. um, and said, the only way you can build any kind of consumer facing product is, you know, knowing who you're talking to, what's your destination. You walk up to an airline counter and they used to say, where are you going before they say empty your pockets and take off your shoes and all the other stuff today. But right, right. what's your destination? Well, I knew that our destination needed to be different than what it was. Most sports, unfortunately, target you and me, mm -hmm. you know, middle aged white males mm -hmm. who they believe have the resources to be season ticket holders. Well, that didn't work in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, everybody's from somewhere else who's here. Mm -hmm. And so instead of being your second favorite team, because you live here, we went after the next generation Atlantans. And there is a huge number of young people who were born here and raised here. And the other thing we did that hadn't been done in pro sports is we marketed to um, diverse audiences. Mm -hmm. Again, Atlanta is 50-50 population between black and white. It's an incredibly diverse city. And we marketed to people who wanted to love and support our game. And they've come out in huge numbers. And right. so True to Atlanta became a lens for us. If you Last year, I had the good fortune of touring the Melt um, intern class through our building mm -hmm. and show that our building reflects our city. If you hold up a mirror to our building, it, it reflects Atlanta. We have a four chair killer mic swag barber shop overlooking the court. We have mm -hmm. a bar on the floor behind the basket. We have old lady gang who are the, the, the mm -hmm. women from the Real Housewives of Atlanta's restaurant in our building. Zach Brown has a distillery and restaurant in our building. And every element of that building was designed to be like Atlanta. If you put it in Charlotte or Denver, it would fail. And that's by design. Mm -hmm. And so well, mm -hmm. understanding who you're talking to, understanding the voice to talk to them, which is something I did learn in television about voice and how important it is to talk to people consistently and then deliver on what you promise. Mm -hmm. I'm making some notes here myself because it's it, it, it is amazing. And so you, now you've been with the Hawks. Is it six been, years? I was going to say six or seven years, and the transformation <clears throat> continues to just be amazing. And 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 the transformation of the arena. But you also made another point that always stuck out to me is that you began to market. So like in the middle of the week, if somebody was living in Alpharetta. They're not going to trek all the way down to downtown nope. to go to a basketball game. So you it, you reshifted an entire mindset of how you also were trying to pursue the audience that was more convenient for them to come to State Farm Arena. I mean, you had a lot of science yeah. behind this, right? Yeah, I mean, our strategy was called grow by shrinking. Focus who we're going on. Atlanta traffic is hellish at best. The idea you're going to travel an hour and a half in the car to come down to a game is probably illogical. Why put resources against that audience? Mm -hmm. um, we call them the Alpharetta unicorns. And I don't know how many of the listeners are in this metro area, so I apologize. But Alpharetta is a, a distant northern suburb. And right. the point is, we wrote that audience off, but we didn't do it in a disparaging way. We said, we'd love to have you come. And actually, there was a guy from Alpharetta who came to every game who every time he saw me would put on a unicorn hat. And we both had a nice laugh about it. But um, <laughs> so so uh, as we as we wrap up, two or three headers from the perch you sent in. We we love you know, what 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 one of the great things we've uncovered in all these podcasts is just future careers that we may not have thought about. So for instance, we were interviewing athletic director. There's jobs in mental health and data analytics and fan analytics and all those types of things. And so you made a statement earlier on, like you know. Um, Businesses run on strategies for in finance. So um, within an NBA organization, professional sports teams, the Hawks, where and what should, where are the jobs, what are those jobs going to be and what should students be doing now at their college campus, which we say is the ultimate professional lab, to prepare to go to work for an NBA team? 
Where are those think, jobs going to be? I, I think the idea should not be to go to work for an NBA team. I think the idea should be to build skills. Mm -hmm. I don't need an empty vessel. No mm -hmm. disrespect. Um, mm -hmm. I, I need people who bring something. And mm -hmm. when you come out of school, anything you can do that helps you build your skills and your professionalism is valued. The greatest advice I can ever give is don't listen to your parents because your first <laughs> job is irrelevant. Mm -hmm. Mine had a box cutter, a feather duster, and I was stacking wine. Okay. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I've run now multi-billion dollar companies, NBA franchises, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So your first job is not your last job, mm -hmm. but you better build skills in that first job and in that second job. Mm -hmm. um, and those skills are what makes you attractive to companies. Those skills are what gives you the confidence and the ability to go build a, a career versus having a job. Mm -hmm. And so you've got to do everything you can to build skills. Mm -hmm. Well, and, 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 and what you just said unwittingly or wittingly is you reinforce the other thing you say is that find a way to bring value to an organization or an employer and be willing to do that. And you'll never be unemployed in your life. Correct? Yeah. I mean, I was able to transition to different businesses because of the skills I de de developed. People mm -hmm. who've come with me, people who are peers. You look at the people who are running teams in Atlanta. You have the former president of Mercedes, mm -hmm. who now runs the Falcons in United. You have the former chairman of Turner Broadcasting, Terry McGurk, who runs the Braves. Mm -hmm. And you have myself from Coke and Turner. You mm -hmm. don't have people who came up as fans or came up through the box office. Mm -hmm. We came up in other businesses and you're seeing that in sports now, every mm -hmm. single team and every single day. So mm -hmm. love sports, let it be your passion, let it be your hobby, look for opportunities. And if there's opportunities to build skills at a sports team, that's great. Mm -hmm. But don't go looking for a job at a sports team because you love sports. Mm -hmm. That That's not going to serve you well. Mm -hmm. and, and I think, you know, I think that's tremendous because that's so many people reach out to me and go, Oh my God, I have such a love and passion for sports. And I'm like, you know, goodbye. Nice. Well, yeah, Thank you for yeah. calling. Yeah. No Here's kidding. Number. So, so in closing one, one thing, one piece of advice or one thing that gets Steve Coonan's attention. If somebody's trying to solicit you via email or handwritten note, LinkedIn, What's one thing that would get your attention? Because you, you get sought out after by many, 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 many people, just a profile and inspiration. But one, 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 one tip of the tip of the trick of the trade. Yeah, I mean, share. without acting like an ass, it doesn't. <laughs> so, but if they got I'm a voracious reader. I, I mean, I, I read probably five to six hours a day. You and I, you I and mean, I share that, yeah. Magazines, clips, articles. And when I see something interesting, I'll go um, follow up and find out who did that. And what I, what I don't want, I mean, I've had somebody named Will send me his last will and testament. I had people send me <laughs> shoes to say, I want to walk in your shoes. <laughs> Cute. I can't remember your name. Um, right. And it's not going to move me. What I want to see is success. You know, the reason that some people get promoted and do well and others don't is you have to own something, meaning mm -hmm. you have to be responsible. And so Vince, on this call, you're, you're telling me stories of things that I did because those were ownerships of those ideas. Right. You know, and so I, I urge the people who are starting their career, it's a long arc. I mean, look at your career as a bridge, not a step ladder. Right. And take steps on that bridge to get to the destination on the other side. But understand it takes a while. But when you're on that journey, enjoy it and understand that it does take time to build right. the skills to accomplish. You're not going to get to the destination. The, the Mark Zuckerbergs of the world are few and far between. Right. Yep. Um, and so enjoy life. I mean, I, I think if I, you said to me, what's the thing you're the most proud of is that I 
had a lot of business success, but I also had mm -hmm. a life with raising kids and a family and a community because I found balance. So mm -hmm. I'm not impressed if you're in the office 90 hours a week. I'm impressed by people who make a measurable contribution and drive the business forward. Right. Right so. now, I, I, you, 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 we, ironically, we use the Zuckerberg. I say, hey, look, he's a unicorn. You don't hear about the 99.9% .9 who are. I mean, you know, you're an overnight success. I'm an overnight success. It was just a long ass night. I mean, we've been grinding at this stuff for, you know, 40 years or so or more. But uh, um, Steve Coonan, we could sit here all day and have this amazing discussion. But uh, we know you're busy. You got it. Uh, you got a. You got a lot going on personally, professionally. And I always admired your balance. So I've, I always modeled uh, or tried to model my relationship with my son, Carter, uh, of my, you know, of your relationship with your son, David. And then when I would see you guys and you'd hug and kiss one another, I'm like, man, I'm going to be that, that I'm going to be that kind of dad one day. And so that always it inspired me uh, as well. So um, Steve Coonan, uh, CEO of Atlanta Hawks. Um, yeah, um, unbelievable career, you know, chairman, of, uh, president of Turner, uh, marketing guru of all time, but just a wonderful, wonderful human being. Uh, and we thank you uh, today for joining uh, the students of Virtual Melt U as they're all just learning and clawing uh, in this crazy COVID world to try to advance themselves any way they can. Thank you for having me. Most enjoyable. Thank you, Steve. Thanks, Vince. Hope you enjoyed today's virtual class. We'll be back soon with another edition of Melt University 2020.